Uh, David grew up in Adelaide. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering from Adelaide University and an MBA from Curtin University. After graduation, he worked for Adelaide Brighton Cement at their Birkenhead plant in Adelaide and also products plants in the Barossa and in Perth. In 1996, David joined FCT, an industrial combustion company supplying industrial burner systems to the high temperature mineral processing industries of the world, such as cement, lime, alumina, nickel and iron pellet. FCT was successful in bidding for the design of the Sydney 2000 Olympic relay torch and the supply of the stadium cauldron burner system. As engineering manager of FCT, David was involved in the design of the burner system for the relay torch and the national natural gas-fired cauldron. In 2004, FCT successfully supplied the Athens Olympic Games with relay torches, stadium cauldron and the iconic rings of fire effect located in a shallow pool in the middle of the stadium. In 2005, FCT started a new company called FCT Flames to focus on supplying flame effects, cauldrons and relay torches to the major sporting events of the world. Having been involved in every Flames project since, David is now the CEO of FCT Flames. David's with us today to share some insights into what happens behind the scenes when creating iconic flames at some of the world's largest sporting events. Please welcome David. Thank you, Bo thank you Byron, and thanks for the invitation to have me here today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that Dick Johnson was pretty instrumental in uh, getting me here, and he unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but uh, thanks to Dick and to Byron. Um, Yes, we've been in, uh, in the Flames game since 2000. Uh, I've just got to turn this on, like the other gentleman said. So while we're just getting over these technical hitches, um, yeah, look, um, we're at FCT Flames is a, a Adelaide-based company. Our head office is down in Theberton. Uh, we're an engineering company. We've got uh, mechanical, electrical, and uh, chemical engineers on staff, uh, as well as some technicians uh, f uh, for uh, you know electricians and gas fitters and so on. But um, we were lucky enough to be involved for, uh, with the Sydney. Torch uh, design project uh, first with the, with, in conjunction with Adelaide University, who's been a long time research partner with FCT. And um, I've got the Sydney Torch. I've got the Sydney Torch with me. You all remember this, this item. Um, FCT uh, had to design the burner system to go inside this object, which was already. Got my hands full. The object was already designed by, by an artist, but uh, they hadn't worked out how they were going to make, put a flame in it. So it was our job to um, sort of work with the university and with our engineers and technicians to, to work out how to put a flame in that. So in, inside the torch, if you've sure you ever seen one open, but um, there's a space inside for the gas canister. Uh, they run on a propane uh, butane mix, and the gas canister will run the torch 10 to 12 minutes. And up at the top of the torch, um, we designed a special burner, which we now um, license the technology from Adelaide University. We called it the crinkle burner. So if you look inside the torch, uh, as, I pass it, as we pass it around, you'll see that there's a very small burner inside this torch, which meets the Olympic standards of um, winds up to 100 kilometres per hour and rain up to two inches per hour. So this, this took us about 12 months to develop. and. Let you pass that around and feel free to take a photograph with it or, or um, as, as it goes around. But this, this crinkle burner we found could be scaled up to, to very big um, sizes. Um, so from a very small flame in a, in a torch to a massive 10 metre high flame, this crinkle burner has proved very uh, useful to us over the years. And then after designing, after being involved with the torch project, we also ended up supplying the burner systems for the cauldron at the stadium. And uh, the Sydney Stadium, uh, 
flame was about 10 megawatts. So that's a very substantial flame. If you remember your single bar radiators, one kilowatt, there would be 10,000 single bar radiators uh, positioned at the top of that, uh, of that burner. To, so a significant amount of uh, energy released. Uh, we also supplied the portable cauldron the portable cauldron burner system for the uh, for the Sydney for the Sydney Games, and then we um, did some testing for the for that uh, ring of fire that Cathy Freeman was involved in. We were a bit concerned about um, a bit concerned about uh, temperatures and. Uh, the Cathy would be ex exposed to, so we did a fair bit of work in the laboratory to work out uh, you know, what was actually going to be required in terms of uh, uh, keeping her safe. And the, these iconic moments, um, there's always a fair bit of pressure. You might remember with, with Sydney that there was a bit of a hiatus here at once uh, when the cauldron got to the bottom of the, the uh, the, the stand and uh, was due to a, a very minor electrical hitch that had to be overcome uh, in, a, in a hurry, unfortunately. But uh, luckily, all, all was well on the night. We went back to our industrial combustion then for three or four years before we thought we'd have a go at the Sydney, at the Athens um, Olympics. And again, we were very successful in Athens. Um, our managing directors, uh, Con Manius, have uh, got Greek background, and we thought we'd have a go. Uh, pitching for Athens, and the torches, we supplied 14,000 of the Athens torches, they were built in Australia, and again this used the crinkle burner that we'd already developed for the Sydney game, so the crinkle burner is a very stable, very suitable burner for, for small torches, and I'll pass that one around as well. But as, as part of the not only did we supply the, the torches, but um, we also supplied this rings of fire effect that you may remember from 2004. We were burning uh, natural gas on the surface of a shallow pond in the middle of the stadium. And this, the heat release, each of those rings is 15 metres in diameter. And the heat release there was 60 megawatts, so there's a very substantial uh, amount of heat released, and you can actually feel that up in the stand, uh, the, like the heat radiating from from that uh, uh, from that effect. And that was a last-minute effect. Uh, we had about four months to develop that. Um, so our, our guys were busy down at Theberton, uh building ponds and testing different sorts of ignition systems and uh, gas delivery systems um, to to get that installed. And we also supplied the burner system in the cauldron. This is also a natural gas fired effect. Unfortunately, the, the gas um, authorities in Greece couldn't come to grips with um, sort of the, the size of the flame and the technology that we were using, and we never actually got this system approved for use, but they gave us commissioning gas for two weeks. And uh, that enabled us to run, the, run the, the cauldron for the duration of the games under commissioning gas. We were a bit concerned about setting that guy on fire as well, so we had to take some precaution there about uh, <laughs> turning the gas on. And uh, the thing with the Olympics is that, uh, you know, the, the cauldron's the grand finale of the opening and there's, when there's a couple of billion people watching on the television, when they ask the cauldron to, to start, there's, there's no second chances, that, you know, it, it must start. So we put a lot of, a lot of effort into the design. Um, we have some redundancy built into the control systems, uh, into the gas systems, so that, um, you know, we, we can't afford to, for the cauldron not to light. I mean. In, 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 in industry, you can say, well, sorry, you know, we need to fix something, come back in an hour, come back tomorrow or whatever. But with the Olympics, uh, you know, you've got no second chances. So that was, that was the Rings of Fire. Um, this was what we were given. The, 
We're normally given a creative brief, and this is what we were given for the Rings of Fire. The, the, the artists had come up with this animation. And that was it. So, <laughs> so we had to uh, set about um, trying to work out how we're going to bring that to life. And um, so in the end we had um, a lot of heavy industrial gas equipment under the, under the stage, under the middle of the stadium in a, in a tunnel. We can see down the bottom left there, big gas valves, pressure regulators and so on. And on top of the, in the pond, um, we had to lay out a lot of spaghetti to um, to deliver the gas. So you can see, I'm not sure if I've got a pointer here, but the um, there's there's some. You can see a ring in the background, a ring in the foreground, and and this gas pipe work is is delivering the gas from under under the under the tunnel up through the the uh, th through a hatch in the in the pond, and out through this this pipe work, but. I was there with my family for about 10 weeks uh, installing this in, in, and commissioning it and testing it in, in the pond. Um, in, so then in 2005 we started FCT Flames. We thought there was a business in it, we thought we could make some money and so we started a company called FCT Flames and the Asian Games was our first uh, project un under, the, under that company. Again, we were successful supplying some torches. 8,000 torches for the Asian Games in, in Qatar. And we also supplied the, the cauldron and a flame at the top of a 300 metre high building adjacent to the stadium. Unfortunately, on the, uh, the night of the opening ceremony, they had a one in a hundred year storm. And you can see it's quite windy, but it was also raining and uh, quite a bit of the aerial show had to be cancelled due, um, due to the weather conditions. But um, this, 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 this sequence had been practised many times in the dry but not in the wet. That, that, you can imagine walking up the stadium out here at Adelaide Oval, that's about how steep the, that ramp was. So, and uh, I'm not sure they had a plan B. <laughs> but luckily the horse made it to the top of the, uh, top of the ramp. <coughs> now this, this ceremony was put on by David Atkins. Um, he, uh, he's an Australian uh, producer and... Um, this cauldron was designed by Michael Scott Mitchell, a, 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 a designer in, in Sydney. And it was a massive structure that uh, lifted out up from behind the, the stadium, weighed about 20 tonnes. And we had to integrate the burner system into the, into the cauldron here to... And, uh, there's some quite complicated um, moving joints inside that. You can see the structure starts to move so we had to bring the gas up and around the uh, up and around Whoop. whoops sorry about that <laughs> but um, yeah we had to deliver the gas to, to through some rotating joints and uh, provide the ignition system all, all remotely. Um, so that was a cauldron on the left and the, and the 60 metre a 300 metre tower on the right which had a 60, uh, 20 metre high flame and a 60 megawatt flame. But these are the sorts of things we get. Uh, a creative, an artist has already dreamt up a concept and then they, they want to put it to a flame in it. So for Rio we were given a, a very small model by the artist on the left. Uh, he wanted a, a ball of fire, he wanted the sun burning. Um, and so it was our job to try and bring that to life for him and these days we're using 3D CAD called SolidWorks and without 3D we, we wouldn't have any hope of, of designing projects like this. Um, in the end the, the product uh, looked very similar to his, his model and this, this was um, an LPG fired burner system sitting in a shallow pond of water slowly rotating in, inside the stadium. 
We've worked in Beijing uh, on the Beijing Olympics in the Hong, at the Hong Kong Equestrian Club. Uh, we've done projects, uh, all of our projects are overseas, the Vancouver Winter Games, um, five burner systems, um, all engineered, built, designed in Adelaide, uh, down in, in Theberton. So our, our scope was to put burner systems very close to glass there. So we had to do testing in our lab to make sure that the, the glass wouldn't crack or break with it being exposed to uh, the heat. And also we had to take into account that, that it was the winter games and that uh, if there's rain or snow that the, the, the glass wasn't heated and then it would shatter if it got, got wet and cold. So we ended up um, specifying some very special borax sort of glass at the top to um, around the burner system to protect uh, you know the glass from from breakage. In Singapore Youth Games, we um, we were given a um, fairly interesting brief um, for this cauldron as well. It, um, it was on a floating platform in the Singapore um, har or in the downtown area, I think they call it the creek. So in the Singapore Creek they had a floating platform for the, for the ceremony to, to be produced on and the, the client had a very small scale uh, uh, flame effect that they wanted, wanted to scale up. So um, our engineers had to work out how to make this six metre high torn tornado flame in the uh, in, inside a glass um, enclosure. So this is this is the first time that we've done you know anything like that. So again, we built a scale model down in our workshop uh, to understand how the uh, the flame behaves. It's like a chimney that one. Uh, there's a there's a a natural draft um, and some veins at the bottom of the chim uh, bottom of the with the glass structure that make the air swirl inside the chamber and then the gas goes up the middle of the up the core. So this is our guys down in the workshop. We built a scale model a couple of meters high just to understand you know what vein angle we'd need, um, how much gas it would use, uh, just how it would perform. And in London, we were involved in the London Olympics. If you remember the London cauldron there was 200 burner systems there. Uh, we had to design and work with the artists to make sure the burner would sit in, inside the, um, the petals that they wanted, to, copper petals they wanted to use. And we, this was a natural gas effect. So if, you're, if you know natural gas on your stove at home burns very blue. If you, if you mix too much air with natural gas or you get good mixing, you get a blue flame. But that's, that's no good for the Olympics. They, they always want a nice orange, uh, you know, luminous flame. So we had to design the burner system and the gas nozzle to uh, give the flame height they wanted and yet try and get the, the, the nice bright colour. And um, everyone remembers the London opening ceremony, no doubt. Um, I think this, this one, for, for me, is probably one of the more special cauldrons. If you, if you remember, there was 205 uh, burners one representing every country competing, and um, the final symbolism of all the of all the countries coming together, you know, still gives me goosebumps when I when I watch it. And after the opening ceremony, a friend in Germany called me and said, I just couldn't believe the uh, you know how, how unique this particular cauldron was. But this was a natural gas-fired effect as well. Um, it's the total heat input was about 10 megawatts, so again, a very substantial gas usage. Um, and I believe, oh, I wasn't actually there, but the, the technicians that were there said that they had to reprogram the lighting sequence three or four times because the creative team will have a look at it during rehearsals and they say, oh, no, actually, can you do, you know, we wanted to go a different direction or a different, different lighting sequence. So, uh, tearing their hairs out, having to reprogram the PLC every, every night to, uh, to get the right lighting sequence. But every burner was individually controlled. There was an ignition transformer, a burner controller, a uh, special gas supply to each burner to, uh, to get it to light up in, the, uh, in, a, in, that, in that sequence.
we work with an automation company in in the, in the UK to uh, who who built the structure underneath to that were, that lifted all these uh, arms together. So we have to work overseas, internationally, with other suppliers to integrate our equipment in, into those sorts of um, into those sorts of effects. But yeah, the the, uh, the symbolism of all those countries coming together to compete, you know, at the Olympics. Uh, uh, it was one of the one of the more incredible projects that I think we've worked on. And uh, I see Byron's uh, giving me the wrap up, so I'll we'll just leave it by saying that um, you know, we're continuing to work in this field. Um, we're doing projects all around the world. We were at the Rio Olympics in 2016. This year we're working in Turkmenistan. They're having some uh, the Asian indoor martial Asian indoor martial arts games there. We're at the Friendly Islamic Games in Baku in April. So there's many, many events around the world uh, continuously that you never realise it, uh, all looking for flames and, uh, and special features. So uh, I hope that's been uh, of some interest to you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating what you've achieved. Uh, some questions from the floor, please. Thank you. The question was about uh, transporting flames around the world. Is actually, I understand that the Olympic flame moves around between countries on aeroplanes. I gather they carry the, pl the flame. Do you know anything about the technology they use, and is it your technology to keep a flame contained in that environment? Yeah, um, it's not our technology, but we we do know that they use a, 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 a miner's lantern. Actually, um, they light the flame in Olympia from the sun's rays and then they transfer that flame into a, into a miner's lantern um, which is a paraffin sort of based uh, you know, lantern with a, with a glass enclosure and um, they've they managed to get that approved for, uh, for, for, for use in flight so the, the small flame travels uh, by plane in the, in the miner's lantern and then when they get to the other end uh, they start the relay by drawing the flame out of the lantern and lighting the first torch and then it's torch to torch as, as, the, as the relay progresses. And then the final torch comes into the ceremony and uh, lights the cauldron. So that's the, that's the sequence. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David, for a very illuminating uh, talk, illuminating. And, um, especially for somebody who's been in the gas industry for 103 years. But I just wondered whether you um, had ever seen any footage of the Melbourne version in 1956, and I'd like to say just how far you've come. That was <laughs> like the burgers on a stove. It was blue and it was a big circle and it was pretty awful. But you've gone a long, long way. But I wondered whether you'd like to uh, go a little bit further on the uh, magnificent... Uh, performance in Sydney with Cathy Freeman disappearing, etc., etc. I thought you might like to maybe enlarge on the, uh, what would it be, minute and a half when uh, three executives of the AGL had heart attacks because it, it didn't light exactly at the appropriate time. I was just wondering whether you could tell us what went wrong there. <laughs> well, I, I might have to shoot you all if I tell you the real truth, but no, it's... Uh, no, it, um, yeah, there was a, a, a nasty hiatus, at, uh, as you know, when the when the cauldron lifted off the, above Kathy's head, and then it was stuck there. Um, luckily, that wasn't any of our supply. Um, we were wait, our burner system was waiting at the top of the stand, waiting for the for the disc to arrive. But I believe a limit switch didn't make. So when the when the circle lifted, it didn't. The system didn't know that it had reached the top limit. So it didn't flick the switch, so it couldn't move on to the next stage. So some poor technician was sweating under the stage, and I believe he had to get into his PLC program and override the limit switch and tell it to move on to the next, uh, to, to, to actually lift, because it was, it was actually in position, but it just, the system didn't know that it was there. So we've struck that so many times over the years. We've had, in Vancouver, the, in the opening ceremony, the... Um, the four burner arms were under the stage and then a trapdoor had to open, four trapdoors had to open. 
Well, on, on the night, only three opened, and at the last minute, they, they're saying to the operator, you know, number four's not going to go up, you'll have to isolate it. So this poor guy with, you know, 30 seconds notice had to try and work out where number four was, isolate it. Otherwise, it would have turned the, all the gas system on and lit the, the burner up under, under the stage and set it all on fire. So we... We put a lot of effort into our systems with the redundancy, backup systems, you know, backup power, parallel gas paths, um, all sorts of redundancy to make sure that you know, when we push the button that it does start. But unfortunately, some of the other suppliers haven't been so lucky. But <laughs> touch wood, we haven't uh, had a failure yet. really interesting talk. I'm just wondering, uh, obviously safety would be your first priority. Could you elaborate a bit more on what you do to make sure that these things don't go pear-shaped? Yeah. yeah, you're right. I should have mentioned that earlier. Look, safety is our you know, number one priority. Is when, we, when we design these systems, we, we also do some computer modelling. Um, we use CFD um, computer modelling to look at the temperatures around the um, the burner system, radiation to nearby uh, performers and uh, the crowd sometimes if they're seated nearby. So we do do uh, uh, modelling, uh, computer modelling to predict temperature plumes and exhaust gases and so on. We do um, our control systems, have, as I said, have got redundancy in them so um, you know, they fail safe so if, if touch wood that hasn't happened but if anything was to go wrong we've got you know over pressure switches in our gas valve trains so that if a regulator fails and we go over pressure you know we can shut down um, we've got uh, automatic sa safety shut off valves in our gas valve trains so that uh, if you hit the e-stop button you know we, we, we stop the gas supply um, and the also and the other thing we use is, is um, pilot uh, pilot burners like, like you have on your hot water service and those sorts of things but slightly bigger scale but each cauldron's always got um, two or three pilot burners in it to make sure that we've got an ignition source so if, if the, if the uh, torch isn't quite in the right place for uh, lighting the cauldron at least we've got a proven ignition, ignition source so when we hit the main gas supply we know we're going we're gonna to light up. So we do take the safety very seriously. In Sydney actually uh, we did some modelling in, in a wind tunnel and uh, we actually recommend that they move the cauldron to a different location at the top of the stand. It was actually originally too close to the, to the crowd, uh, to the seated audience, and uh, some of the modelling show that the exhaust gases and hot gas could, in certain conditions could blow down onto the, you know, onto the audience. So we actually recommend that they move it away and up higher, which they, which they did actually do. Uh, yes, we are. We are looking at that. Um, at the moment, you know, you can get different coloured flames in alcohol-based um, burner systems. You might see, you know, the football and the cricket, they have uh, these shooting flames. You can get them in alcohol-based, but we are starting to look at whether we can do that with, uh, with the, uh, in a gas-fired system. So we're, we are investigating the use of different salts um, to, as you say, create red and blue and green flames and so on. But so far we haven't uh, had the request from the, from the Olympics, but um, they've got the five colours, so uh, at some stage I'm sure it uh, <laughs> sure will be on the agenda. Well, David, thanks very much again. It's, it's absolutely fantastic to hear your presentation. A small gift from the club. Um, you might be able to put a little torch in that. We could use them as a special <laughs> Rotary Club of Adelaide memento. But thanks very much for coming along. Right. We really appreciate it. Can everyone show their appreciation? Thanks very much. <laughs>